Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this webinar this morning on the new OCSIO base. Um, as usual, we'll just go straight into the presentation, and if you have uh, any questions, we can get to those at the end. Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. Let's get started. Today, we're going to be looking at the new OCS IO base with its built in IO, including flexible inputs. Let's look at our agenda for today. We'll start with a quick review of OCS IO and then we'll focus on the built-in I.O. through those six built-in I.O. points. There are flexible inputs, DC outputs, universal analog inputs, and analog outputs. We're going to look at I.O. wiring and Seascape configuration. There will be demonstrations throughout, and we'll finish with a Q&A session. OCS I.O. starts with the CNX I.O. base, as every OCS I.O. system requires a base. The base provides the interface between the OCS I.O. and the OCS via the C-SCAN network. The connectors are ORJ45, but they're using C-SCAN from a protocol standpoint. By using ORJ45 style connectors, it allows you to use Ethernet style patch cables, which makes wiring easier. The IO base includes six IO points of its own built into the base. When you start an OCS IO system, you need a backplane connector assembly, which is available when you purchase your CNX base. You can specify whether you want a four position backplane assembly or an eight position backplane assembly and it's no extra cost when you order your base. Now, at some point in 2023, there will be a single backplane connector included with either an IO module or a base so that you can do the assembly in the field. Once you have your base and your backplane connector assembly, then it's a matter of filling it out with up to seven additional IO modules that meet the requirements for your application. And you can see on the screen, there's a variety of different options. And it really doesn't matter what combination of modules you add to your CNX IO base, the CNX can handle it without any problem. Now we'll look at our main focus for today, the built-in IO. We have a total of six IO to review, two that we're calling flexible inputs, two that are DC outputs, one universal analog input and one analog output. And they're all wired to the removable terminal blocks, which are located at the bottom of the CNX base, the same point at which you apply your DC power to power the system. We'll start with the two flexible inputs. They're flexible because they can be used as either digital or analog inputs, and if you're using them as a digital input, the input voltage that's used to turn on when the switch or the photo wire switches, that's also configurable. Also, if you're using the flexible inputs in analog input mode, you have the ability to configure them between different signal types. And with those two flexible inputs, they're independently configurable, so one could be used for analog and one for voltage, or both for analog or both for voltage, depending on what you're looking for. Now we'll look at using a flexible input as a digital input. So we have a variety of things we can configure. First of all, we can configure whether we want it to be a positive logic syncing input or a negative logic sourcing input. You can specify what you want the voltage range to be, whether it's a 24 volt input, a 12 volt input, or even the less common 5 volt input. Or if you want to pick a custom range, you can configure custom on and off threshold points for that digital input. Now we'll talk about using a flexible input as an analog input. You can select between voltage mode or current mode, and you can specify whether you want the full 0 to 32,000 scaling range or something narrower that might be easier to scale. These flexible inputs are 12-bit analog inputs, so you can choose an appropriate range depending on how you'd like to do your scaling. Now, another thing that adds to the flexibility of these inputs is you can change how you've got the inputs configured as either digital or analog, and what the ranges are, etc., without hard coding that into Seascape. You can assign variables or registers to that function, and you can do it in the field. So, for example, you could build your own maintenance screen where you change the configuration of those flexible inputs, and you might have multiple applications where sometimes you want to use a voltage sensor, and sometimes you want to use a current sensor, etc., so it can definitely be advantageous. On the previous slide, we showed the configuration details for using a flexible input in analog mode. On this slide, we're showing you how you can use those flexible inputs in digital mode and how that changes the values that you put into your registers or your variables at runtime. Now we'll demonstrate how we can configure and use those flexible inputs. So we go to Seascape and into the hardware configuration area. From there, we'll go into the CAM1 tab. In this case, we're using an XL7 for this demonstration, which is two CAM ports and the OCS IO is connected to CAM1 in this example, because we're just talking about the IO and the base today. We've only got the CNX base without any expansion IO. So we double click on the CNX base and then it shows the details for our configuration. 
where the digital inputs and outputs start from addresses scheme standpoint. We're using variable based advanced ladder, which is why you see these arrays here. If we were using register based advanced ladder, then you would see direct memory addresses here, like I33 and Q33, AI33 and AQ33. But we're using variable based advanced ladder, so we're using the built in arrays, and we've also assigned a status variable, which is 15 consecutive words. And we'll look at that again later. But most of our configuration for the built in IO is handled by the onboard IO tab. So we'll go there now. Flexible inputs are handled in the centre part of our configuration dialog. So let's take a look at this here. So for each channel, we need to click this checkbox to enable the channel. Here we've configured channel 1 as a digital input, but instead of selecting 12 volts or 24 volts, etc., we've configured a custom voltage range where the on threshold is 14 volts and the off threshold is 6. If we had selected 12 volts or 24 volts or 5 volts, we wouldn't have had to fill in the details for the on and off threshold. For the second flexible input, we configured it as an analog input for 0 to 10 volts and selected a data range of 0 to 32,000. So that's how the scaling is going to work. So for a value of 0 volts coming in, we'll have a digital value of 0. And for a full scale value of 10 volts coming in, we'll have 32,000. So that's the way we have the configuration for the flexible inputs. So we built this screen for demonstration purposes, and we can see that we have two indicators for our two flexible inputs if they're used in digital mode. And then we have two analog indicators that we use for using the flexible inputs in analog mode. We'll start with our first flexible input, which we've configured as a digital, and for an on threshold of 14 volts, and an off threshold of 6 volts. So here we have our variable voltage source, and we'll gradually bring up the voltage, and when we get up to about 14 volts, we see that input turn on, and it stays on. And then we'll turn the voltage down, and when we get down below 6 volts, we should see that input turn off. So that's the first flexible input, again using it in digital mode, and in this case, actual custom threshold area as well. Now we'll look at the second flexible input, which is configured for analog mode in 0 to 10 volts. Here on our simulator we have 0 volts, and we're at about 5 counts, and because we have 12-bit resolution here, it's close to 0. If we have a 5 volt signal, we should be around mid-range at 16,000, which we are. If we go up to 7.5 volts, we should be up around 24,000 counts. And if we go full scale, we should be up full scale as well. And we are. So again, we configured the first flexible input as a digital with custom thresholds, and the second one as an analog. Next, we'll look at the one universal analog input that we have. So with the two flexible inputs, we can use those in analog mode if we want, but we also have a dedicated analog input available, which is universal as it supports not just voltage and current modes, but temperature sensors like thermocouples and RTDs. Also, this universal analog input is 16-bit resolution, which is very, very good. And in addition to being able to set various scaling ranges, if we're using it with a temperature sensor like a thermocouple or RTD, we also have the ability to configure the input range. We also have digital filtering and some optional alarm handling, which we'll look at later. Now we'll talk about using a universal analog input with a thermocouple. So for example, say we have a thermocouple sensor and we want to connect that to our universal analog input. To do that configuration, we need to configure our thermocouple type. We need to select whether we want Celsius or Fahrenheit as the scaling. And we also need to note that the value will be reported through the analog input register in 10th degree increments. So if we're in degree Celsius mode and have 100 degrees Celsius that the temperature sensor is reading, then we would get a value of 1000 because the reading is in 10th degree increments. So that is using a universal analog input with a thermocouple. If we use analog input with an RTD instead, we can choose between PT100 or PT1000 sensors. And again, we can select between Celsius and Fahrenheit, and the values are reported in 10th degree increments. For voltage or milliamp range, we can choose between 0 to 10 volts, 4 to 20 milliamps, or 0 to 20 milliamps. And we can also choose between a variety of different scaling settings, 0 to 1000, 0 to 4000, 0 to 32000, etc. This is a 16-bit input, so to maximise resolution, we would be better off selecting 0 to 32,000 for our scaling, which is the widest range available. The advantage of going with 4 to 20 milliamps instead of 0 to 20 milliamps is because, though they both will work, we have our highest resolution with a 4 to 20 milliamp setting. 
Again, like with flexible inputs, you can actually change your sensor type as well as your scaling on the spot. This is a big advantage because if you have a machine where sometimes you use RTDs and sometimes thermocouples, or even if you always use thermocouples but the type can vary from application to application, now you can set up your own configuration screen on the OCS and all the configuration of sensor type can be done in the field without using Seascape. Another thing that we're offering with our universal analog input is a built-in alarm handler. If you choose to make use of the built-in alarm handler, you'll assign four consecutive registers, if you're using register-based advanced ladder, or an integer array with a length of four to be able to assign in the field for different alarm levels, low, 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 high, and high, high. And you can see the status of those alarm conditions by monitoring three bits that are pre-mapped to the third word of the status register, so that's how it's accessed from the program. You can tell by monitoring those three bits if you have an alarm condition and which one it is, so having the built-in alarm handler is very convenient. Now we'll have a demonstration of the universal analog inputs. So we'll go back to the hardware configuration area in Seascape, and then at the top is where we configure our universal analog input. For the flexible inputs, we hard-coded them in Seascape, but for universal analog, we assigned variables to everything. And you can do the same thing with four consecutive registers if you're using register-based ladder. For configuration register, we've created a variable called config underscore UAI, and it's an array of three words starting at zero, as all arrays do. And then we've used the optional built-in alarm handler and assigned another integer array, this time with a length of four for the four different alarm levels. So that's the configuration. Now we look at the bench. For universal analog in, because we have the capability of configuring this in the field, we've set up a configure universal analog input screen here. By using text tables, we can select between the different types of sensor that we might use in our application, and we'll stick with 0 to 10 volts here. We can also alter the scaling of it. This is a 16-bit analog input, so we're probably better off sticking with 0 to 32,000, but we don't have to. We could change to another range here, for example 0 to 1000. We would lose resolution, but the option is there. We also have our filtering set on this screen. Here is our universal analog input. In order for that to read, we must move this wire here from the flexible input over to the universal analog input. And so you can see at full 10 volts, we have a value near 1000, because we chose 0 to 1000 as the scale. If we change to 5 volts, it'll go down around 500. If we go 2 volts, it should be around 200. So that's the universal analog in. To configure that, it can be useful to have the capability of changing to different sensor types on the spot, as well as changing ranges. So now we'll change this back up to 0 to 32,000 and recover some of the resolution. And now we have a significantly higher value because we have more resolution, and when we go to 10 volts, we have nearly the full scale of 32,000. Now we look at a few more types of I.O. built into the base. The next one is two DC digital outputs. These are solid state outputs, which are just on off standard outputs. One of the things that's a bit different about these is they're quite powerful. They can handle up to two amps DC per point, which is higher than your typical DC outputs in most industrial applications. In most industrial applications, it would be either half amp, which is what Horner outputs are usually, or it might be 50 milliamps or something like that. But in this case, there are full two amp positive logic outputs and you can configure them to hold their last state if you choose, but it's quite rare. Most of the time, you're going to want those outputs to turn off if necessary. For example, if it loses communication with the OCS. In addition to those two digital outputs, there's also a single analog output, which is very convenient. The analog output is 12-bit in resolution, and you can configure it for either milliamp mode or voltage mode. In milliamp mode, it's either 4 to 20 milliamps or 0 to 20 milliamps. And in voltage mode, it's 0 to 10 volts. So here you must configure the output type and your range. And you have the ability, though it's rare, to have the value held when the OCS controller goes away. Or you can have it go to minimum, which is the usual in most applications. Like the other I.O. types, all except for the digital outputs, the analog output can be configured on the spot in the field using variables or registers. So again, it's just like the universal analog input and the flexible input. If you want to configure those in the field from a screen that you develop, you can do so very easily. So today we've seen that those six I.O. points that are built into the base are really flexible and they add a lot of value in a lot of applications. So that concludes our webinar for today. Thank you so much for listening and the Q&A session will begin shortly.
Okay, nice and straightforward introduction to the new base coming. Um, next week, we do have planning and OCSIO installation. So we're going to keep on the OCSIO trail of things and keep going with that. Um, registration link, as usual, is up on the website and all these past webinars can be got to as well. I'm not seeing any questions coming in on that. So I think, I think we'll leave it there for this morning. Um, thanks all for joining us and we'll see you again next week.